uh, now we have uh, about 60 minutes for uh, what we are called an unstructured conversation between uh, between the speakers and the commentators and uh, with uh, with um, with questions from the audience uh, there will be no break um, so we will pick up now on the topics from the first two days and there's possibility to comment on what we have heard already today um, right now we don't see I don't see any raised uh, uh, hands so I could start off with um, with one question for um, our first commentator, Eirik Natos uh, Hansen, you said some, uh, you brought some news today about um, the interpretation of the laws in Norway. Um, did you say that um, the state attorney um, um, has said that there's no legal restrictions for using the methods today? Does that um, also um, uh, does that did, does that also regards um, search in private ancestry uh, databases, uh, the method that's been used in the Golden State Killer and in the recent Swedish case? Is that also? Uh, do you have anything to add there? Uh, first of all, I'm not uh, an expert. <laughs> in law. <laughs> um, but from what I have heard, uh, it's not that problematic um, to, um, to do forensic phenotyping, um, to decide eye and hair color um, compared to um, this familial searching uh, methods. Mm. But I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't uh, give you a law and, and say that uh, here, it, here it is. Mm. Oh. oh, I see. Great. Um, uh, Matthias Wienroth has uh, raised his hand. Matthias? Hi, thank you. Uh, um, good morning and thank you very much to um, the speakers today. It was really good to um, hear your uh, points and it's so good to have such a variety uh, of viewpoints um, available as well, which is a, a brilliant opportunity um, that this um, event has offered. Um, I'm really pleased to hear um, about um, IRIC's um, focus on training and validation. Um, I think there's a really important point, um, but I'm a little bit concerned um, about some of the implications that came through in um, the focus on uh, the legal situation only in, in Norway. And I, I want to uh, briefly pick up on what uh, Shrek um, implied, um, the social nature of technology, that technology is not neutral. Uh, and also what Per Arne was saying about um, the role of perceptions that data is not neutral. Um, the, the information we generate from the data that technologies produce um, will be perceived in certain ways, will be interpreted in certain ways, and will then be used in certain ways. So I really want to emphasize those two points, that technology is not neutral. It's really important to always remember this and to not fall into this um, fallacy that um, just because the you know, technology is based on science, um, that it's sufficient just to focus on the scientific feasibility. And that's why I made the point that we need to have a tripartite uh, a validation system, which of course includes the scientific validation, but also looks at the operational validation. So how it's used in society, it's really important. And I don't see that happening at all, nowhere. Not in Germany, not in Norway, not in Switzerland. And I'm, I'm quite concerned about that. Uh, and the third one, of course, is um, the social validation. And I can see a little bit of that happening, but often it is brushed aside for example, by saying, well, despite legal and ethical concerns, um, the methods are scientifically sound, so we go forward with it, um, also because the law doesn't prevent it. And I really want to emphasize um, the, the three practice-based values that I spoke about um, during my talk on, on Wednesday. Uh, they are reliability, utility, and legitimacy. And legitimacy is not just about the law, not just about um, the legal domain, not just about proportionality. It includes all of those, but 
but it is also far more than just what the law allows or doesn't allow. Um, as I said, there are cases, um, many cases, where even though the law doesn't provide necessarily for the use of technology, technology is used anyway. So we've got plenty of uh, those kinds of examples in Germany before the legislation was put in place to um, permit uh, forensic DNA phenotyping. Um, so I really want to uh, call on, on all those involved in um, development and decision making around new technologies. Make sure that you consider justification and trust uh, of these technologies because the worst thing that can happen is if um, a technology um, that is scientifically sound um, is then basically misused um, and, um, and applied in ways uh, that are actually um, contrary to uh, their intention, which is to help establish or re-establish social order. So, so I think uh, it, it's quite important to, uh, to consider this. And I, I did talk about this notion of the um, veracity of data work, and that includes uh, also thinking about where the data come from that inform and train um, technologies. So, uh, you know, I, I would really like to emphasize that uh, we need to listen to um, those, uh, um, the voices from, from society, from, um, uh, from various different um, uh, uh, borders, not just from science and law, in order to make good decisions about and, and trustworthy and justifiable overall legitimate decisions um, about the use of these technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, and that was a message for um, maybe especially not only the police, but also politicians here in Norway. So you should bring that um, forward, uh, Schweib, as the only representative um, right in the, in the panel today. Um, do we have another name here? Um, we have one question from uh, from um, to all experts in the panel um, so I'm going to read that aloud um, now genealogy based methods using DNA should be a tool in investigation should not exclude other investigative tools in autonomous driving experts say that 98 percent hit in mapping the environment environment and identifying the road or the cars and obstacles is not enough. Genealogy should be one of the tools in the toolbox of the forensic investigation. Is there any case where criti critical decisions made were based on genealogy based methods alone? I think that's the question. Is there a case where critical decisions made were based on general genealogy based methods alone. Maybe is there someone who would talk about with reference to some uh, specific cases. I think um, Andreas uh, Timar um, talked about the Swedish case Wednesday, but I think I could I can maybe add and follow up with a question for uh, Matthias because um, we're talking about them. Uh, Schweib mentioned the margins of error, and uh, Eric Natos and both the Thomas Berg has talked about uh, reliability, like the test and the analysis itself. Um, but um, there was a German case, uh, Wienroth, in I think it was back in 2017, where um, that's been an example of how uh, there's still space for human judgment. I think it was uh, the the test or the uh, analysis said that um, the police, it was rational for the police to search for a woman of Eastern European origin. And then they started an investigation uh, that was directed against uh, people from the Romani uh, people, which, and the, the DNA analysis itself uh, did never say, give that clue. So that's been some criticism. Could you, could you tell us a bit about if you know the case? 
Uh, yeah, I think um, what you're referring to is the, um, the case um, usually referred to as the Phantom of Heilbronn. Yes. Um, and um, that was in, that was much earlier, 2007 maybe, or, wow. or even earlier than that. Um, so, I mean, you can look it up, the Phantom of Heilbronn. Um, yes, um, I, um, I've got colleagues who've um, um, written and spoken to that uh, topic uh, widely uh, in Germany. Um, uh, Anna Lippert, for example, um, from the University of Freiburg. Um, and my interest has always been in this case, the different types of um, interpretations of what is useful and what is successful. Um, the, the scientists um, who were, who were um, drawn upon in, uh, to do the analysis here actually were not German scientists. So the German police was investigating. It was um, illegal uh, to use um, this technology at that point in Germany. So they used Austrian scientists um, to provide um, the analysis, which of course is also uh, um, questionable, uh, really, when you think about just alone the, the legal side of things, um, as I was um, mentioning earlier. Um, but anyway, the scientific analysis pointed to, um, as you said, uh, towards to uh, an Eastern European uh, woman uh, in this case. Uh, and because there were so many instances at, where, at which the, um, the DNA was found, um, that the police was um, suggesting it was a very mobile criminal person. And on the basis of this kind of um, assessment, they interpreted the scientific finding as a person being from the Roma community. So it's a very culturally, um, almost like a prejudiced interpretation of um, the, the, the scientific data using uh, social uh, and cultural uh, impressions. Uh, and in the end, it turned out that the sample belonged um, to a factory worker in Poland, a, a factory where um, this, the uh, material uh, was produced, um, the, the, the swabs were produced, that were used in this criminal investigation and they were not produced to a high um, industry standard so that the DNA of the person who was making them was on all the swabs. Um, so she was not actually involved in the case at all. But for the scientific analysis, this was a successful, um, uh, a successful case because they did uh, infer it was an uh, Eastern European uh, uh, woman. Uh, and it turned out that yes, that, is, that was correct. It was an Eastern European woman. But in terms of the police investigation, this was an absolute catastrophe um, because they made the absolutely wrong decisions all along, uh, all, all along the way. First, in going outside of Germany to use this technology that was not allowed to be used in Germany. Um, and then um, also to, um, to infer that this was a particular uh, population, uh, which was then um, in, the, uh, in the focus of the media. So uh, this is a really important case where we need to think about both the, the societal cultural um, use of this information and also the different ways of how we can understand what is useful and what is successful. Um, I think we'll follow up with now Rose uh, and uh, Heather has raised their hands, uh, but I think I take one more question uh, for Matthias, which is from, uh, that is from Victor uh, Tum that we would like to have in the panel today, but uh, uh, but then had to cancel due to other duties. Um, his question is, but what if society says that these technologies should be used en masse to solve crimes? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, my question to you is, um, explain what you mean by society. Um, this is a very generalist question, and of course you, you put it, I, mean, I know Victor very well, um, so it's quite a provocative question, um, which we are used to from, from Victor to, to stimulate our thinking. Um, so, and my question would be, well, this is a very generalist approach, um, which I'm always arguing against. Uh, so first of all, what do you mean by society? Um, we need to be quite careful that we don't fall into what some might call uh, a dictatorship of the majority because it is minority groups that we're particularly concerned about here uh, in terms of uh, using this particular technology without care. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't use the technology. I'm saying we need to be absolutely um, uh, careful in the way that we might apply these. There is, there's probably good cause to use the technologies, um, last resort, for example, but it is very, very careful, as I said time and again, um, to really consider in what cases to use the technology and how to use it. So I talked about training, um, I talked about um, oversight, 
Um, the, these are really, really uh, important things. I talked about an ongoing validation. So, um, you know, I, that's my answer to your question. It's, it's um, you know, we need to do more. Yes. Um, uh, then I think we'll, um, we will hear from, uh, give the word to Ross Hopman, who raised her hand. Uh, yes, I just wanted to tie in with what Matthias was saying or his first uh, comment about technology, these technologies not being neutral um, and to add another consideration to that because um, we've been talking the past few days a lot about error rates and about accuracy and this also ties into what uh, Schweib was saying. So what I've seen in my research that actually these technologies are more accurate for individuals that are that have more pigmentation. So individuals with darker eyes, darker skin and darker hair, this, these technologies work better. And um, this is certainly something that also needs to be taken into account uh, when we think about uh, the accuracy rates of these technologies and what kind of surveillance they would feed into. And want to comment? Thomas? While you think about that, we will pick up um, uh, some comments from uh, Heather first, and then we have another question later for from the audience. So, Heather. Yes, and um, so I just wanted to pick up on the genetic genealogy question um, about cases hinging really solely on genetic genealogy. So that was the case with the Golden State Killer case that I mentioned um earlier uh, on the panel so that case was exactly about genetic genealogy and kind of the sneaky poli work, police work maybe the kind of um, in a way uh, the dirty police work that was mentioned uh, in one of the talks um so this was exactly using this uh using the dna evidence from an old rape kit um taking the strs from that and putting them into uh, an open genetic database that's used for, for what you might call recreational purposes, I mean used for example by people who are adopted looking for their families, um, by people trying to find their ancestry, in particular people who might have had that ancestry taken from them through the slave trade for example. Um, so it was a, a database of particularly vulnerable people that were exploited by the police, um, and, and I use exploit in the, the hacker sense again of, of exploit as kind of finding this security gap so they knew that they could put this uh, sample in and then find any relatives, so find anyone who might be related to that sample uh, through that method. And that was exactly the same thing that I was pointing to in my film. I mean, this was clear to me as well in doing research that this was a kind of gaping hole. And as I, I'm sure <laughs> many of you know, so after that case, which was really prominent in the US, um, was successful, uh, this method of, of kind of using this sneaky way of inserting samples into a database like that was struck down by a federal court in the United States. And this is what led to then uh, requiring the um, request for permission from people to use their DNA in that way. <clears throat> and I just want to mention that because I think that was brought up also by um, Torid Haugen Tor in her talk. And I thought that was a really important thing she mentioned about how when Jedmatch, when Jedmatch asked people for whether they would give their permission to have their samples used in the database, that only 20% of Europeans said yes. And so if we're talking about what society thinks about how their DNA should be used, that's some really clear data. And if you want to know what do people want done with their data in Europe, start by looking at that. I think it's really clear they don't want familial search. Um, yes, that was in interesting about like the Jed Max match uh, changed their privacy policy after the state killer from um, uh, Just short to follow up Heather Where can we see your latest film if we want to? Oh, yes, uh, so I put a I put a couple links into the Q&A as well um, yeah. So you can if, if it's there you can follow the links there so you can see the trailer on my website um, and a, and a brief excerpt um, there. And then just contact me and my gallery if you wanna borrow the film, loan it, screen it, whatever, we can, we can work that out with you. Oh, great. Really happy for that. 
Uh, now we have a question from uh, from one of the one of the attendees, uh, Gregor. Um, um, he, was he right? The panel has given a rather unbalanced viewpoint, in my opinion, that we should move forward very cautiously in the implementation of these new technologies and consider the ethical implications with many valid concerns. However, I would also argue that it is unethical to delay implementation. As time proceeds, the window for closing cold cases diminishes. Do we not have a duty to move forward with the greatest speed justifiable? Anyone amongst the panelists who feels? <laughs> I would like to say something uh, yep. about yep. that. Uh, uh, that's an important point. And we uh, in media very often work on cold cases and are often very interested in in new evidence, new traces, uh, including uh, forensic uh, evidence. Uh, so my answer to that would be uh, a very a very big yes, of course, one should move forward with anything that could uh, help bring light to both new and old cases. But also here are uh, some of the uh, examples and cases uh, mentioned here, uh, how important it is, uh, how the, the forensic findings are interpreted, uh, percepted, and how sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, prejudices uh, consciously or unconsciously uh, affect the interpretation. So, so, so that tells me that we have to work on these cases as, uh, as journalists and uh, editors and media uh, in our normal critical manner. Uh, what, what's this conclusion based on? Uh, what about the evidence points against this specific area or ethnical group? Uh, just to try to ask those questions. And I'm sure and I hope that uh, police investigators will ask themselves uh, the same question. But um, yeah, that's my answer to that. Uh, we would be interested in looking into uh, forensic um, evidence in, in cases that are not solved, uh, but we all, always have to be work uh, after the same principle uh, as we always do. Check the facts, uh, check the reliability, uh, reliability uh, check the, um, the doubts, uh, and, um, and uh, make sure to report also on the reservations about, uh, about forensic findings. Yes, I think um, um, Gabrielle Samuel has indicated she wanted to, to comment on um, uh, Gregor's question, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that his question relates to a broader question in terms of ethics, in terms of what is the ethics of not doing anything. So I think that's the question that's being asked here. And I think that if we're going to consider the ethics of not doing something, then we need to know what the benefits are of actually doing that thing. And we don't know what the benefits are yet. I think that's the crucial point. And as so many of the other panelists have so rightly pointed out, a lot of these technologies are surrounded by these promissory discourses, this belief that these technologies will achieve these benefits, it will solve all these cases. And, and it has done it, you know, in some specific cases, it has achieved that, it has been a great technology. But to premise the fact that, that we should be driving ahead with this technology because it could have real benefits is taking away the question that we don't know if those benefits are there, which then speaks to broader questions about how do we evaluate the technology if we do bring it into use. Um, and it also raises a question which I've, I've kind of, over the last few days of listening to this, this conference, what I've kind of taken away is that a, a lot of the ethical discussions have been around how we can implement this technology. Whereas when I first came as a social scientist looking at this field a few years ago, they were much more centered on if we should use this technology. So I've seen a, this shift in thinking from if to how. Now I don't see that as, as generally problematic. I think some social scientists should think in the if and some in the how, but I don't think we should forget that if question. I think it's really important that we do think about what is the value, what actual value do these technologies bring and how can we show that if we are using them with all the appropriate safeguards that we are evaluating those technologies at the end. So if we get to a stage where they're not bringing that 
that benefit, that value, that cost benefit, and I talk about cost benefit in an ethical and social way rather than a monetary way, that then how are we going to proceed? Um, the other couple of bits I, I just wanted to talk about genetic genealogy was that um, there have been a range of cases in the US where genetic genealogy has been used as the main means to identify um, suspected perpetrators. And there's a whole range of ethical issues that are associated with these, which I, I spoke about a little in my talk. But one of the things that hasn't been spoken about uh, that much is that the, this messiness of, of forensics and recreational and health use of DNA data. And I think that deserves a little bit more attention. There's a, there's a study in the UK that's just about to begin that's exploring, um, it's exploring, now I'm probably gonna get this a little bit wrong because I'm a little bit fuzzy, but it's, it's to do with the uh, not-for-profit organizations, Oxfam and the like, uh, the, the, um, the, rape, sexual misconduct of people that are involved in those, those organizations that have left many women in certain countries with children that they don't know their fathers. And um, the idea of this project is to use just genetic genealogy as a way to try and identify those fathers, um, which raises a whole range of ethical questions about uh, not le I mean, it's so many questions that I, I don't want to go into, but not least because these genetic genealogy sites allow forensic use of DNA if the forensic scientists first approach GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA to ask permission to use it. You're not allowed, you're not permitted as a forensic society scientist or a police officer to just go and upload your DNA to look for a match. It has to be permitted. So where do these messy cases where researchers have DNA around, you know, cold cases where the, where the child and you're trying to identify a father, but it, it's slightly different to adoption, where do they fit in terms of forensics or health or recreational use? So I think it's a lot more messy than that. And in terms of the consent issue, just coming back to that 20% of Europeans don't, uh, are not interested in genetic genealogy for forensic purposes. I've conducted a range of interviews in the UK. Yes, a very biased sample, but that's not what I'm getting. And many, many surveys show that there's a general support for genetic genealogy genealogy but I think the consent process around them a way to to simplify do you want to allow police access or not which police in which jurisdiction for what criminal cases for what types of cases all of these things need unpicking so I'll stop there because I think I've rambled on enough <laughs> uh, but yeah those are my two cents worth can I say uh, something um, I have uh, Matthias uh, first and then we'll get to Marail and then Eirik. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sure um, I wanted to speak directly to uh, Gabby, so I'll just keep it very brief. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, um, I agree with what Gabby was saying. Um, a really important thing is to consider um, not just uh, if you want to use the technology, uh, but when it is actually useful. Um, so, for example, the case in Germany, the double homicide, well, it wasn't double homicide, it was two individual homicides um, in, in 2016, December 2016, there was a big call for using forensic DNA phenotyping because everyone assumed it would be really useful in finding it. But it was forensic scientists themselves who said, well, actually, it would be completely useless to apply this technology in this case. Policymakers and um, uh, law um, enforcement agencies were adamant, though, that this is exactly what they need for cases like that. So again, there is this discrepancy of uh, when something is useful and when something is simply be demanded for, you know, uh, the impression that there is a, another tool in the toolbox to uh, fight crime. Uh, and another point is we need to think about the goods. Um, a lot of people say, well, we should use any kind of tool we have in order to catch killers. But what we do when we try to uh, catch killers, as it were, we are also um, disadvantaging uh, large population groups at times uh, through technology use. So again, I talked earlier about this question. Uh, if you're trying to um, recreate social order, but you're actually destroying social order uh, in, in some other ways, then there is the question of whether it's actually useful uh, to use this technology. And my third really brief point, because I don't want to take up too much time, is do we really want Dirty Harry's? <laughs> Yeah, that will be for Jens Erik uh, in a bit. But first, uh, Marel Kaufmann uh, has raised her hand. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I was also uh, intrigued by this question of how we do, or like if we shouldn't move forward fast, my answer to that would always be like, how do we move forward fast, right? Because much, maybe not enough has been done on ethical impacts of these technologies. I think we can still go a long way there. Um, but my, or, and I also think some of my colleagues' points of views is here also, if we actually look at how this technology is engineered, and if we actually start speaking to those people who build these technologies and implement them in their everyday lives, we understand that actually these people don't always necessarily understand each other, right? Like the person that actually works with the biology and the person that actually translates the biology into kind of an algorithm, the person that comes up with the parameters of an algorithm, the person that then translate the parameter from an, of, that defines an algorithm into mathematics and so on. All these people don't necessarily always understand each other, not least to speak of the police that in the end should implement these technologies. Um, so in that sense, um, my point is to say, as long as we don't, you know, as long as the, the, the professionals actually don't really understand each other in terms of what it is, what they're actually engineering, what kind of sociology and biology they're actually engineering into these technologies. Um, I don't think moving forward fast is, is really the answer. Um, so, so that's one thing. And another aspect that we really haven't touched much upon um, in, this, uh, in this setting is also that technologies that are developed at the moment for maybe forensic purposes. Now, uh, Gabrielle has touched a bit on medical health purposes. I mean, that is, these are overlapping fields. They're always meandering. They're always creeping into other fields where these technologies will be reused for other new purposes. These biobanks that we are currently building will be used for other new purposes. So you can ask whether that is the responsibility of the one developing the technology to think about whether this technology will creep into other areas. It is maybe the responsibility of the people who build the biobanks to think about whom do they give access to or not. I would say to a certain extent, yes. So please be aware when we start uh, developing these technologies, um, first, do we actually understand each other when we develop these technologies? And secondly, um, what are we actually contributing to long term, especially if we ask, if we now use these very emotionalized ideas of, but we have to solve crime to move forward. Mm. Thank you, Marail. I, th I think Eirik uh, should comment first, and then we have Jens Erik and then Schwab. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, these tools, uh, they are coming, and it's, it's uh, very difficult to, uh, to sort of overlook them. Um, and the key here, I think, is to regulate the use uh, and, and harmonize it. And it might be also a good idea to harmonize it internationally between countries because um, it, it would be easy to, to shop between countries, as Matthias said, about the, the, the German case. So I, I think it's, it's very important to, to decide what information can we extract. Uh, we don't see everything. We are dependent on searching and extracting what we, we need to determine uh, which person uh, a biological trace is coming from. That's just a small amount of the genome. And then how this person looks, that's another small amount. And then you have all the rest that we don't know anything about. Um, and that is one thing. And, and which cases should we use this in? That's also important. Um, and who is allowed to, to do this analysis? Uh, can it be one day that every person uh, can use these tools? Or is, uh, should it be uh, just certain groups, for example, the police who can do it? Uh, yeah, that's my comment. Thank you, Erik. Uh, Jens Erik uh, Schelsen um, has raised his hand. Mm. Yeah, um, and thank you for the question. And, and uh, I think my comments are, well, probably covered already, but uh, I sympathize with the fastest possible 
question, of course, but I think it, as indicated, it means as fast as justifiable, really. And uh, what is justifiable? Then I, I, I think I, I have a, a lot of sympathy for Matthias's uh, approach with the three uh, elements and, and uh, studying it uh, upstream and downstream as well as midstream. Uh, but then there's a problem of emergent technology, of course, which, uh, I mean, technology is uh, developed fast these days and uh, there is not enough time to test properly b before the next big thing is, uh, is up online. So uh, we need to keep a, a, a cool head, uh, even in, when facing moral panic. We don't want dirty Harris and the police uh, at least anymore. I hope. <laughs> so still, police investigators as well as researchers are, are curious people. So they want to, to, to use whatever is possible. And there are limitations and there must be limitations. Uh, the, the problem today is, as uh, well, somebody was um, touching upon yesterday, is that much of this technology is becoming cheaper and it they are developed by private companies and perhaps offered directly to police officers and investigators or as a kind of test. Uh, we've seen that with the Cleview uh, AI application recently. So we need uh, another line of defense against this and, and that's uh, the, the Dirty Harry problem resurfacing, so, so to speak. So. Uh, my main point, I guess, is that as fast as possible, but that means as fast as justifiable and it needs, we need to take a, 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 some kind of balanced attitude towards technology, not just be uh, a thoughtless techno optimist or, or anarchists even, but not pessimist either. So, so to find the balance there is uh, the, the, the difficult thing, I think. Some sort of a, a clean Harry, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not a good, just as good uh, as a TV show, but uh, but uh, more responsible. Uh, Shwab Sultan, you wanted to comment. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, if you don't do anything criminal or wrong, you shouldn't have a need to keep what you do hidden. And uh, then we can have massive surveillance. Uh, most people can say, see that uh, this argument does not hold water. Uh, privacy laws are there for a reason, and uh, information gathered for one reason, like somebody mentioned uh, earlier actually, uh, can and we can almost say will be used and misused for other reasons. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, the reason why I'm so focused on addressing the weaknesses is uh, sort of what is known as the Blackstone formulation, better that 10 guilty people are released and one innocent is convicted. And I'm afraid that if we push this too fast, we might end up with quite a number of innocent people convicted. Um. Now I think we go to a question from uh, from one of the uh, from one of the attendees. Um, uh, one moment. Here is from uh, from one of the viewers, Debbie Kennett from the UK. Um, and that is where the other countries should implement laws against DNA theft in light of uh, what you showcased in your, what Heather Duve Hagberg showcased in her, in her um, artwork, work of art. Um, DNA theft, like searching for someone's uh, garbage is, uh, is, uh, is not illegal but maybe should it be given the opportunity to to do analysis and to, to to get information on a person anyone wants to comment 
Um, I think uh, Eirik and Heather was... Uh, Eirik? <clears throat> Now we don't hear you. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Now we. Now you can hear me. I think I think this is an extremely important question, and and one that also should be regulated. Uh, you know when the new technologies are coming, we can't. We don't know what to expect in the future. What we can get out of the DNA analysis and what kind of information we can get. And, and maybe today it's defined as uh, garbage uh, because today it don't have any value. <laughs> but but uh, in the future, it might be uh, misused and, and um, uh, by private persons or by police, for example. So so it's important. Uh, uh, Heather, you wanted to comment on the same, and you could also. Uh, I have a follow-up question for you later. After that, sure. Yeah, so I think there's there's um, before the kind of thinking about the surreptitious uh, DNA testing uh, part. I think it's important to think about the network by which cells and data already travel um, with tremendous frequency. So there's a huge market that exists that circulates leftovers. I mean, basically the bits and pieces that are left from blood samples and from biopsies and all of these things, not to mention uh, actual dead bodies, is it's a bit gruesome, but <laughs> it's a real thing. I and mean, so there is already a very vast uh, network by which cells and, and data circulate. And so I think that is something that's used extensively in research and it hasn't been hasn't come under enough critique so i would really say if you're concerned about that that is really another topic to get deeper into that could use a lot of unearthing and i think journalistic attention as well now with regard to uh, for example what i did in stranger vision so picking up cigarette butts and so on there are some regulations around that it's just that as we move forward that will be incredibly hard to enforce and so this is something i've thought about a lot a kind of question of how do you protect yourself from me um, as we end up having uh, small DNA sequencers that can operate very quickly uh, in our, our bedrooms for example there will really be nothing I think to prevent people from doing this kind of surreptitious testing if they wish technically um, and so I think the only sense that I've been able to make of this in my own reflections is really that we have to think about this as more of an issue of social norms. So it's fine. I mean, it's good to have the legal regulations there too. I just don't think that that will be enough. So I think on top of the legal regulations, we have a lot of work to do culturally in building social norms that um, make it so that if we, if we think it's bad that you surreptitiously uh, analyze someone's DNA, then we need to have that as, as part of our kind of cultural fabric. Um. Uh, yes, um, a follow-up question for you, uh, Heather, from uh, from um, from Madeleine Hyenjelm. Um, uh, she would like to hear about what you think, uh, not only you, but then about the risk that criminals will find ways to work around these technologies. I know that the, after your stranger visions, um, you developed this kind of DNA spray to pollute uh, the crime, uh, crime, this is the crime of scene, is that? Um, yes, <laughs> so I think that we always see that with any new technologies, there's always this kind of race um, to beat them, to uh, crack them, to find uh, exploits and these, this kind of thing. I think that that is really with every new technology, you see that that's the case. And so I did develop this kind of DNA cover-up spray after working on Stranger Visions. Um, and I did that really to show that DNA evidence is vulnerable, so that there is a, a need to question the kind of uh, any kind of blind uh, authority that's just placed in DNA evidence as a gold standard without thinking more in detail about really how it can also be polluted and manipulated and forged. Um, and so it's actually pretty easy to forge DNA evidence or to create uh, elaborate mixtures that might make a DNA profile look different than it is. And there's a lot of scientific work that backs that up that isn't just me 
uh, doing weird art <laughs> stuff as well. So I always base the things I do on published scientific research. Um, so I think that that is this kind of um, uh, Red Queen's race that you'll always see this, this uh, growing kind of counter technology developing alongside. Um, there's a uh, back to the, this privacy issue. Um, uh, we talked about like in the, in the European regulation, the GDPR, uh, there's a distinction between the biological material and data. So as far as I know, bio biological material is not, as, does not have the status as data. Uh, data is something is the result of the analysis of the of the material, but then uh, there's a viewer here um, that points to a UK law UK law against DNA theft, and I think um, uh, in Norway we have the same um, um, regulation that it's uh, prohibited to test someone, so to say, behind their back, but uh, in these cases we don't. There's no someone. Or you don't, there's not a person. So you don't know who, who the spit or the saliva, etc., is from. And that's, would that be even, is it possible? And would it even be, uh, is that a way to, to proceed to try to regulate that? Um, I don't know if that question is for me or not, but just briefly, I think I, I've looked a lot at the different laws around the world, and I mean, in the United States, it's also by state. So every state has different laws around this. And in my read, all of them provide a lot of gray area. And whether it's an exemption for research or other kinds of things, I mean, there's usually some kind of loophole there that makes the thing really very difficult to enforce. I mean, there have been cases um, where where people have been surreptitiously tested and it's gone to court and um, and that has been prosecuted. It's just that that it requires a lot. And I think that won't cover most of the kinds of cases that will come up as DNA testing becomes easier and cheaper and we can all do that at home. What will stop us from testing each other, um, from testing within our families, uh, looking at our friends, uh, these kinds of things. Um, um, a couple of questions now, if we look, look, look take a look into the, the future uh, in a way. Um, uh, I think Shwab Sultan, he addressed this, uh, what in ethical terms is called the slippery slope. Uh, uh, what do you think about the risk of that we open for some restricted use, but then we kind of lose control and uh, uh, we end up in some kind of uh, surveillance state or or we get the kind of use that we have seen in, in China with like massive, massive uh, DNA testing of the male population, etc. Is that, um, is that a concern, something that we should be concerned about? Marail raises her hand. Raising my real hand here. Um, so I, I think I try to re repeat a little bit what I tried to say before. Uh, I don't think this is a slippery slope. I think when we look at data, at biodata, I think we're actually looking at the idea that the function of that data is the creep. Yeah, as we like to say with big data, we have the problem that we collect information and that that information is 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 always going through some kind of life cycle yeah it's it's generated it's processed it's used and then it maybe dies or is deleted or it is reused and then it goes through new cycles in other areas right so i actually think there is um <laughs> the slippery slope is an is an old term i think we're definitely going to face a future where 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 DNA material is going to be part of the surveillance that is happening. I mean, it's maybe nothing, not not really in the section of DNA data. But if you already look at, I think maybe we mentioned it these days at uh, what uh, Elon Musk now develops with Neuralink, this thing that you can put into your brain, like this chip that is being put into brains and that kind of maps out 
different uh, different joints uh, joint positions, which is by the way used to uh, now of course uh, develop uh, health solutions for for paralyzed people and so on and all of this is extremely important but at the same time his project is more ambitious than that he he seeks to kind of support something that he at the end would call something like voluntary telepathy you know this idea that you, we can kind of connect to each other without a phone at the moment this sounds all sci-fi but i actually think this is this is a very close uh, future scenario and in that sense we have to be very careful whom we are um actually linking up to with regards to whom we're giving our um our dna to and i don't think that only regulating it by law is, is the answer. I agree with, with Heather completely, but I also think the problem is here that as soon as we have um, this, um, this, this discourse around uh, biobanks where we can get personalized information about ourselves, which is also exciting, I think we're having almost like the uh, uh, yeah, like the idea of a, of a personalization, the idea that Google and, and Facebook and so on have been working with for a long time of giving us services that are personalized for us while we are happily sharing our data with them. And I think uh, biobanks, in a sense, do something quite similar. They actually ask us to, to share information, to give us a personalized service in return. And then where this information ends up in the end is, as of now, terms and conditions I'm pretty sure we're going to have to read quite to, through quite a few of them to understand where this information is going to end up. Heather? I just want to mention very briefly that we are already seeing the hints of this um, and not to be at all alarmist about that, but just that what I observed with COVID testing, so mass COVID testing, that we have now these uh, infrastructures coming into place for doing mass biological testing and for example preventing uh, individuals from accessing certain resources um, services places based on the results of their biological testing so i um i live uh, and teach in abu dhabi in the united arab emirates um at least before the the pandemic and what i saw as the uh, as the lockdown came and as these restrictions came into place and how that's unfolded is a really mass rollout of this kind of biological access control and it's really not hard to imagine how that can expand i mean if you think of this kind of function creep or that it's already built into the functionality that um you already are taking swabs or um uh, saliva samples from people all the time in some places every day and that is something that can easily grow i think in time <laughs> It's interesting that you say, Marela, that maybe the slippery slope uh, um, uh, concept is, is, is not a good one. I was reminded about uh, one of the uh, best-selling authors in, in, here in Norway last year, the historian Yuval Noah Harari, in his lessons for the 21st century, I think he says that if somebody describes the world of the mid-21st century to you, and it doesn't sound like science fiction, it is certainly false. So maybe that's uh, uh, something to learn from. Um, you were all invited to, um, I will not try to conclude and sum up what, what's been said during three days, uh, but we are getting close to, to, to finishing here and you were invited to, if someone wants to make some concluding remarks, uh, we can get to that now. Um, I think uh, maybe Judith have again Thor uh, wanted to have something that she wanted to say. There you are. Um, yes. Um, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to um, to thank you um, for a very good and important uh, webinar. Um, and I feel I have uh, reports to read and, and talks to review um, and certainly important angles uh, to look at. I think these meetings are, in fact, um, for that, um, to pick up um, things to learn, um, definitely. Um, Ruth Hopman uh, with the Race Face ID Project, um, 
she was referring to the comments from uh, police officers uh, that uh, knowing the perpetrator may be Asian, um, and that is a good clue. Um, and I think that's that's where I'm coming from, anyways. That it is a starting point and a clue, and it could be a piece of the puzzle. Um, and uh, the law enforcement uh, personnel are skilled professionals, and they are trained investigators, and and um, so they are used to. Um, these maybes, and I think that's an, an important part of it too, um, that you have sometimes um, uh, descriptions from witnesses and all, um, and you work with that uh, today as well, and maybe this would be um, one more uh, clue or one more piece to the puzzle as a, as a part of the witness, and sometimes they are very far apart, but that's where the investigators uh, start. And so um, with the regulations and the rules um, put on these uh, procedures, um, I'm hopeful it can be accepted and acceptable. And I think it is useful, uh, certainly with the new methods. Um, and I feel we have a duty to the victims and their families also, and that's, that's where I'm, I'm coming from. And, um, seeing certainly that these discussions and the different approaches are very, very important um, to look at. Um, and I hope the discussions uh, can continue and I certainly hope the conclusion uh, can come also um, as far as in Norway um, being able to use these methods. So thank you so much for um, a very good webinar and thank you for the different views. I think it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Turid Avgintor. Um, anyone else who wants to say something, concluding remarks or... Marail has raised her hand, yes. Yeah, I want to join Turid uh, and want to congratulate you for a pretty good mix of practitioners and research work and artistic work that were represented here at the workshop. And I think this is in itself quite a necessary attempt to make these fields actually speak to each other. The last two days have shown how much uh, taking each other seriously is really the only way out of these argumentative bubbles that we sometimes tend to get stuck in a bit. But I think this actually takes more than just an occasional workshop. Uh, so I'm impressed by those practitioners I've heard who engage with the critique and the challenges that DNA analyses actually bring with them whether they experience that within their own field of work, uh, but also by consulting research done by others. So I really think this openness is something that I really want to, that I was really happy to see. I'm also happy for everyone who does not reduce challenges to a footnote here. So um, I'm also thankful for, for any of the work uh, that, uh, or for the attempts at unlocking an analytic uh, or forensic tradition uh, to open it up and to make sometimes taken for granted aspects available uh, to our evaluation and discussion that we've had these days. And um, so I think that DNA and, and the analytic and the scientific and the police practices that surround it have, uh, have to remain contestable. They have to be a contestable field. And without the research done on this, we, we won't be able to contest anything because it hides in quite, quite intense um, formula that not everybody can access just as easily, right? So um, only when we can access them, we can define how we want to have a society that, and how we want to live uh, with these kinds of DNA procedures. So, so I don't only welcome any openness to discuss and listen to each other, but I actually think it's really crucial that we uh, discuss and listen to each other. And I think that the keynotes and several of the contributors here hinted at something specific, namely the problem that many parties work together in using DNA for forensic work and how they collaborate needs way more attention, how specific traits are being valued and actively tied to concepts and ideas and politics, yeah, as Ahmad and Matthias and Rose have pointed out, for example. Uh, we also need to reflect about how a technology and the data that we consider scientific ties in with very personal fields, with sanctuaries that are being opened up for surveillance. Rose has mentioned this, Mahera has mentioned this, yeah, Mahera has mentioned an ancestry. So I would also add that the, the personal stories, the past and the futures, not to forget the futures that are being surveilled and co-created, 
uh, are relevant here, but also um, we're not only talking about personal um, pasts and futures as we've seen in this workshop, we're also talking about the pasts and futures of whole groups, which makes it extra spicy. Um, and uh, despite the fact that there's a, a certain amount of insecurity in the very scientific processes as we've learned these days, we need to understand how um, they have given potential to be actually productive in society. I like that. I borrowed that from Mireille Hildebrandt. Um, she, she says that any, any technology produces something in society, right? It produces an effect. Um, in this case, they co-produce investigations, but they also co-produce society at large. Um, and then just finally, practically uh, speaking about past and futures right now, I, I also see more clearly than before I see the relevance of really making an analytic difference of using, and a political difference of using DNA for investigative and for predictive purposes. Um, they both have their problems, uh, but both are tied to quite different practices and techniques. And so I think our discussions and arguments about that need also more, more distinction in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Marel. I think that, um um, that will work as a uh, concluding remark for this uh, webinar and appeal, as I heard, for collaboration and the value of working together. Um, uh, I'm going to finish off here from the studio in Oslo with a couple of uh, reminders. Um, uh, we will, uh, all the panelists and also the attendees uh, will be sent and um, uh, we will like to hear, get some feedback, some, some evaluation form will be sent on email. Uh, we encourage all of you to, to review and, and to revisit the videos that are uploaded on our U, the Nordic NC Bio YouTube uh, channel. Um, if you are interested in the further future work of uh, the Nordic Committee, please sign up for our newsletter. You will find it on our webpage. The address is there. Um, the next, uh, another reminder, the next webinar from the Nordic Committee is on the ethics of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Nordics. That is a series that will uh, that will start uh, October 16th with a talk from Professor Matti Hairi at the Aalto University of Finland. And, uh, and finally, I would like to, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to express um, a deep thank you again to all of our speakers, uh, to today's commentators, to the audience from all over uh, the world, and not to forget, I would like to thank uh, Nordforsk uh, for financing this um, uh, webinar and especially to Anna Hero that um, you can't see, but she's standing right, uh, uh, right, uh, right there for moderate, moderating and handling the chat, advising on everything from the program to design, social media, etc. And uh, finally, to Startup Norway for for the venue, the studio, and for help with the production. So with that, thank you and goodbye.